Hello, how are we doing? Thanks everybody uh, for joining us. We'll give a little bit of time for people to sign on, but we are here live on Facebook for the special event of Ask an FNR Specialist. So I have a wide range of colleagues and, and good friends on the line with me to talk about a lot of different things, natural resources related. So with that, we will kind of go ahead and, and do some introductions so we can get to the question and answer session. Lenny, take it away. Thanks a lot, Jared. This is Lenny Farley, and I'm an extension forester in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources here at Purdue, working mostly with uh, hardwood, woodland management, and plantation establishment. I'm Brian McGowan. Uh, I'm an extension wildlife specialist here in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at Purdue, and my work is in the area of human wildlife uh, complex, forest wildlife management, and our graduate extension program. I'm Lindsey Purcell. I'm the Urban Forestry Specialist at Purdue University in Forestry and Natural Resources Department. And I work with a wide range of stakeholders and clients from tree owners, homeowners, and municipalities, and to also professional arbors. Rod Williams. I'm also an Extension Wildlife Specialist, uh, specializing in amphibian and reptile ecology, as well as ways which we can engage youth in our natural resources. G'day, I'm Midge Ziski. I'm a uh, fisheries extension specialist uh, and a lot of what I focus on is helping landowners manage their ponds and small lakes uh, on their properties. Very good. So I'm Jared Brook, uh, wildlife specialist with FNR and I deal mainly with uh, habitat management for a variety of wildlife species. So um, if you have questions about how to improve your property for wildlife, feel free to ask them. So, so how we're going to do this is um, we have some questions that have been given to us by um, members of the public, landowners and things that we're going to start answering. Each specialist is going to answer um, a question. But if you have questions for us, put them in the comments on the Facebook Live and we'll help answer those questions as well. Um, so we want this to be interactive. We want to help answer the questions that you may have. We've got a lot of expertise on the line, anywhere from woodlands, wildlife, urban tree care to fish and ponds. Uh, so ask the questions away. We want to answer the questions that you have. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Rod, who's going to lead us through our first question and answer session. Thank you, Jared. Uh, as you just mentioned, uh, lots of questions that come in. And our very first question is related to trees. And so, Lenny, I'm going to ask this question of you. And one of the most common questions that we get are, how do I recognize and kill invasive plant species? Thanks, Rod. Uh, that is a common question we hear. There's a lot of concern about invasive species competing with our native plants in the forest environment. There are a lot of great references out there. I'm going to direct you to a couple. Uh, the first is we have a Purdue Report Invasives website. And I believe we're going to be able to provide you with that uh, web link as part of this program. Or you can simply Google Re Purdue Report Invasives. And it'll take you to that site. Uh, it has links to a variety of sources that you can use for identification of invasive plants across the landscape, as well as invasive insects and other invasive uh, pests and problems. Uh, one of the resources available on that site is the Great Lakes Early Detection Network uh, smartphone app, which is a great tool for identification and reporting of invasive species on the landscape. And so you can get access to that tool from there. When it comes to controlling invasive species, I oftentimes recommend folks visit the Midwest Invasive Plant Network uh, site for their control database. They have an excellent database that covers many of our invasive plant species that we encounter commonly in woodland settings and wildlife habitat areas. And they provide a wide range of re control recommendations for each of these species uh, with the details of the approach, and also a rating of how effective these control techniques are shortly after and then perhaps a year after. Um, so we had Lenny's question wrapped up with invasive species. And now we're gonna kick it over back to Rod, who's gonna ask our next specialist their question. So we just heard from Lenny uh, regarding some plant ID uh, questions. And, and now we have a wildlife related question. And I'm gonna ask you, Brian, a, a question that oftentimes comes up by many of our landowners throughout the state. I see naked squirrels in my yard. Should I be concerned? 
Well, well, the short answer is no, but believe it or not, this is a question that I receive quite regularly throughout the years. And there's actually several causes to why uh, hair loss can occur in squirrels. That's actually the more, uh, the more accurate term. Uh, sometimes with uh, animals, uh, they're just different. And so just like people, you look at different people, some of us are big, small, you know, that kind of a thing. The same thing occurs in animals and even with the amount of hair. So some of this is actually believed to be a genetic thing where they just have fewer hair follicles or some of their hair follicles are actually not functional. Uh, but that's just kind of a theory. But there's actually a couple other causes and I'm gonna show you uh, my screen here and see if I can't show you kind of some of the things that I get. So this is a picture someone sent me about hair loss in the squirrel and uh, kind of zooming in on it, you can kind of see. So something like this is very uh, moderate. It's really not that much at all, but sometimes it can be quite more substantial. And to really determine whether something like this is a skin fungal infection or from a, a, a species of microscopic mites uh, that's specific to squirrels, you'd have to actually scrape that skin and look at look for the mites under a microscope. Uh, but this is quite quite a lot of hair loss in this. And believe it or not, as long as it's not cold out uh, for a period of time, uh, these squirrels can actually live through something like this. And so it comes in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. You can see this squirrel's got a different kind of a, a situation going on right there. Uh, so it actually can kill the squirrels, but uh, treatment of this kind of stuff really isn't recommended. It's not practical for wild animals. Uh, from that standpoint, mange is something that you'd have to treat over a period of weeks. And you would also have to, um, um, you know, so to do that, uh, and they can get reinfected from the mites in their nest and that kind of thing. So from a practicability standpoint, it's just not practical to treat them. And while it looks really bad, uh, in most cases, those squirrels would actually be okay. Uh, again, with the exception of uh, wintertime, if you've got a lot of cold or, or wet weather, it could cause issues there. But unfortunately, there's really not much we can do about it. Uh, but it's not going to be transmissible to your pets or your kids and that kind of thing. Mange uh, mites, they're actually very host specific to certain species or a group of species. Well, thank you, Brian. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some of us can relate more to others than hair loss um, that we see in the squirrels. So I'll just, I'll just uh, leave it at that. I didn't want to say anything, but that's what I was thinking. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question is for um, Lindsay. So Lindsay will ask you to, to come back on. And we have a lot of landowners that want to plant trees in the spring. And so how do they know which tree will work best in their particular landscape? Well, that's a million dollar question. And we, we get that question quite frequently. Um, selecting a tree isn't just a matter of picking something that looks pretty like what's over my shoulder here. Um, it's a matter of function. Trees provide a lot of what we call ecosystem services that improve our quality of life, not just shade and aesthetics, but also cleaner air, cleaner water, um, storm water management. There's a lot of things that trees do for us, but how it functions in your yard is gonna be the biggest question. I always tell people it's easier to, to know what tree to pick when you know why you're planting that tree. And so if you understand the function that the tree is supposed to perform in the landscape, whether it be shade or you just want some pretty flowers, that will help you choose what you want. One of the best things I can tell them is that obviously trees are very important and we plant them for sustainability and long-term solutions and functional benefits, not just the pretty tree like you see over my, over my shoulder here, but what purpose does it serve in the landscape? You know, is it going to be for shade or is it going to be for aesthetics? But I always tell people that if you know why you're wanting to plant the tree, then what tree to plant is always the easiest. And oftentimes it comes down to how much space you have available. And one of the things that uh, we have available at Purdue Extension is a lot of resources such as uh, the Purdue Education Store. And if you go to the Purdue Education Store, and you click on urban tree care, which is right here. It'll take you to all the uh, resources that are available to you regarding pruning, uh, staking. There's also some videos on selecting your tree that I'm talking about now. Um, and there's also a publication for tree selection for the unnatural environment. It's a free download and it'll give you a list of some of the trees that you can choose. 
But by and large, the most important thing to remember when selecting a tree is making sure that it is, a, it is somewhat of a responsibility. You have to water it, nurture it, and manage it for the first couple of years. And then after that, the tr tree pretty much takes off on its own and, and, and grows uh, without any problem. But just make sure you got plenty of space, not just up and down, but all around for that tree to grow naturally. If you want more information, check out the list in this publication, or you can give me an email and I can help out with those questions. Thanks, Lindsay. And again, I encourage folks to check out the education store resources that Lindsay just mentions to you. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the questions that I typically get are regarding amphibian and reptile identification. And so while I don't have time to go into detail on the various species that people generally send me, what I want to recommend to people is if they're going to be sending pictures for us to identify, whether it be amphibians, reptiles, any wildlife species, or any of the plants that you might be sending to, to Lenny for identification, is be really mindful about how you're taking those pictures. So with regard to amphibians and reptiles, make sure you're taking pictures of the, the back or the dorsum, also pictures of the belly if the animal's deceased or you have the animal in hand and you can take a picture of the belly, take pictures of the head, all from a safe distance, obviously, if, it, if it's a snake, and, and provide also the locale because some of our species have limited geographic distributions and knowing where that animal was spotted can provide a lot of insight to us as we try to help you identify that particular species. So there's some uh, resources with specifically to amphibians and reptiles that Brian McGowan and myself and other co-authors have written over the past decade. Things like the salamanders of Indiana, the frogs and toads of Indiana, turtles of Indiana and snakes and lizards of Indiana. So we have a full compilation of how to identify all the various amphibian and reptile species that you might find here in the state of Indiana and our nearby states as well. So I encourage you to visit the education store that Lindsay just talked to you and, and do a search for those particular titles and it should provide a lot of information and insights on how to identify those native species that we have right here in the state of Indiana. All right, with that, I'm gonna switch gears and we're gonna invite uh, Mitch to join us. We have a pond related question for you, Mitch. As spring has sprung and we start to see vegetation growing all across the, the landscape, so too do we oftentimes see it growing in our ponds. And so a lot of our, our pond owners are getting lots of algae this time of year and they wanna know what they can do to prevent this algal growth. Yeah, thanks Rod. And that's a, that's a common question this time of year. Um, Algae is something that can grow really fast. And so it's something, it's usually the first thing that, that sort of blooms in a pond and it can really grow um, volume quite quickly and can overtake, you know, in the, early in the spring before a lot of the other plants in the pond has, have had a chance to, to grow. And, and so uh, there are a number of things that landowners can do um, to try and deal with the, this algae. So um, the best way to, to treat algae is, is with chemicals. You know, a lot of other plants, you can do some manual removal and things like that. Um, but for algae, uh, you want to look at to using some sort of copper product, copper sulfate or some sort of chelated copper product. Um, and it's actually a really good idea to, to start treating the algae as early as you can, rather than waiting until midsummer when it's when there's a huge volume of algae. Um, killing that all off at once can cause all sorts of other problems in the pond. And so if you do a treatment in the spring, you can knock it back. Maybe a month later, do another treatment, knock it back down again. And so if you can just keep on top of it a little bit like mowing the grass, uh, you can prevent some of those algal problems. Um, long term, uh, you know, algae, um, they, they explode in ponds due to excess nutrients and, and excess light. And so um, long term, if you're having algal problems, you might want to look at trying to reduce the nutrients that are entering into your pond. But um, we have a great uh, publication on, on aquatic vegetation management. Um, and so we can provide a link to that that helps you with species ID and, and, um, and solutions to some of those aquatic vegetation problems. Thank you, Mitch. Appreciate that. Next question, Jared, is actually for you. So we will uh, switch gears there and talk about managing property for wildlife. So if a landowner wants to improve their property for specific wildlife species, what might they be able to do? Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of things that landowners can do to improve their property for wildlife, but a lot of it depends on kind of two major, the answer to two major questions. First one being, what, 
wildlife species are you most interested in? Because each wildlife species is going to have different habitat needs. And then the second question is going to be what kind of vegetation types, whether it's woodlands, grasslands, crop fields, do you have on your property currently? And then maybe what kind of things are missing on your property? So you kind of need to address both of those questions when you decide how you're going to manage your property for wildlife. And so for instance, in the woodlands, we can do things like increasing the amount of uh, snags in the stand, so dead standing trees, which would be important to a lot of things like bats and woodpeckers and, and other wildlife species. Um, if we have maybe an old field that's tall fescue or some sort of cool season grass like that, we can uh, improve that for wildlife in a lot of different ways, maybe by killing that existing vegetation, which is invasive and non-native, and allowing native vegetation to to be in there, whether that's through planting the native species or just allowing the field to go fallow and, and providing more habitat for a, a variety of wildlife species. But the best answer I, I can give to this is that it's gonna be dependent on obviously your goals and objectives and your property. So it's really good to, to learn more about information about your property and, and what wildlife species you're interested in. But there's also a lot of free resources out there for landowners to connect with professionals, professional biologists or foresters or others to help give you guidance and answer the questions you have on how to improve your property for wildlife. So we're gonna drop a, a link into the chat box, but it's gonna be basically um, a link for you to go and, and look for professionals that work in your county that can help you improve your property for wildlife. There's also a lot of cost share opportunities available where you can, um, have help creating and improving habitat for wildlife on your property. So that will be in the, in the chat box um, below. So Jared, at this point, why don't we take a quick break and see if we have any questions in the comments for any of our experts that are online. And uh, I'll let you ask those questions and, and we can take some from the audience. Absolutely, Rod. So we have been um, getting some live questions and I'm going to try to piecemeal these together because we've got to, got to go back and look at the old recordings that didn't work. So hopefully we're still alive. Um, but one of the first questions we got was someone asking about, they plant three to five acres of pumpkins and they're having issues with voles in the pumpkins. So I'm going to kick this question over to Brian McGowan, our resident wildlife damage expert. Um, and thanks for the question, Amanda. Yeah, so that's, uh, voles are a small rodent. So they're um, uh, primarily uh, plant eaters. And so they can do a lot of different types of damage to not only things you plant in the garden, uh, landscape beds, but also even trees and shrubs and those kinds of things. And so um, what, what I imagine they're doing is a lot of times with planted things, uh, new seedlings, they dig around the seedling and will feed on uh, the, the seed, the germ that's still there. And by doing so, they actually kill it. And so there's a couple things that we do with voles. Uh, voles, there's, there's a couple uh, uh, toxicants that are labeled to kill voles. Uh, I don't believe any of those are labeled um, for pumpkins. And so that's not an option in that case. Uh, you can actually trap voles. And so, but you've got you know, several acres, I think it was Jared, right? Three to five acres. Uh, that's, that's a lot. It's a lot to trap voles out of the yard. A typical yard is about a quarter to a half acre. And so doing it at that scale is probably not um, feasible. So your other choices are gonna be either to exclude them, which is through um, using some type of a fencing material like a hardware cloth, which again, you're talking at that size, that's not uh, something that's probably feasible. Your best bet in the short term, at least, would be to manage the surrounding habitat. Uh, so from that standpoint, you would want to turn the soil uh, in, say, a six to 10 foot swath around the whole garden. So in other words, you're creating an area where there's no cover. They don't want to go out there and be susceptible to hawks and birds of prey that would eat them. And so they're less likely to make that cross. Uh, the other thing you can do is in the garden itself, make it less habitable. So in other words, try and do weed control, uh, till the soil between the rows, those types of things to really try and reduce the cover 
and other food sources as much as possible. Uh, that's probably not going to solve your problem. It may help alleviate some of the pressure. Um, a lot of farmers have problems with bulls in, in no-till fields. And so they would go out and scout those fields and actually try and turn the soil over or do some type of a disturbance before planting. So you have a period of time where you would do that or even burn down the cover crop. So you have a gap between the time that there's cover out there in another form versus when you plant and provide them cover and food uh, later on in the year. So you're trying to basically pick times of the year that the area is less habitable by those bulls because otherwise control methods on such a large scale like that are really problematic. Thanks for the answer, Brian. And while we got you on, we got another um, question about damage. This one's about moles. So the last one's about bulls is about mold. Okay. Um, having issues with moles in the yard. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, moles and voles, you, you think they're similar because they're spelled almost the same. They're very different creatures. Uh, moles are related to shrews. They're meat eaters primarily. Voles, as I said, are rodents. And so uh, moles this time of year, end of April, end of May, although they're active year round, they don't hibernate. Uh, this is the time of year where they're really starting to do some damage and people start to notice them. So during the winter time, they spend most of their time in their deeper burrows, which are going to be eight to 12 inches or even more, depending on where you're at and, and where the frost line is below the surface of the soil. So right now they're preparing new chambers or, or modifying their existing ones to get ready for to have their young. And so by doing so, they actually push the soil from underneath, deep underneath and push it up from the ground. So you get these big mounds of dirt that are quite large, you know, the size of a dinner plate, uh, like a mixing bowl upside down, they could be quite large and they'll have several of those. And so for an animal that's basically, you know, this big or so and that big around, uh, that's pretty, sub pretty substantial. And they're pushing that soil. So pretty soon they're going to be having young babies. Uh, the thing is that what you can do about moles is there's a couple things is you can trap them. There's several different types of traps. Uh, there are some toxicants that are uh, look like little rubber worms or even grubs, uh, both of which they eat that you put inside their runs and they eat those and it kills them. Uh, there are some uh, um, uh, repellents that you can apply to yards and there's a process to that, basically trying to push them out of one area into the others. Uh, your neighbors you know, may not be happy about that, although they, they may have come from your neighbor's yard uh, as well. Uh, from that standpoint. I'm actually doing on May 14th a more detailed thing about, about moles, but that's kind of moles in, in the in the short short run. But so now is the time to start start working on that. So when they have the surface tunnels where they're feeding, those are where you want to set the traps and those are where you want to apply the, uh, the, the toxicant baits as well. Great, so we have uh, a couple more damage questions come in, but I think, Rod, why don't we uh, kick it around the table and ask some more of the questions that we got prior to starting the event. Sure, that sounds great. So Lenny, I'm gonna kick it back over to you and, and we'll, we'll see if we can add, uh, get some questions regarding forestry answered here. So Lenny, uh, oftentimes when people are thinking about their forests, they want to know what is their tree or their timber worth. So maybe you can give some advice on that. Yeah, that's a common question in a situation where perhaps they're interested in the value just out of curiosity for future decisions. They need to remove the tree or trees for whatever reason, or perhaps the trees have been blown down or damaged. And unfortunately, typically we have to give you the answer of uh, it depends. And it really does. And so uh, standing timber in the woods is essentially a spot market rather than a commodity. We can make any number of different types of products out of those logs. And so the value of those trees is really dependent on the species, the size, the quality in terms of how much clear wood is in those trees, and then the context in which they sit in terms of how easy or difficult is it gonna to be to harvest them and get them to the, uh, the sawmills or other manufacturers. So there's no simple, easy method to say what that tree is actually worth. You typically need to access some uh, professional or experienced assistance to get a good valuation. And so one of the resources we direct landowners to are, uh, is a directory of our private foresters in Indiana who are actively working in timber markets. 
that can uh, give folks valuations on trees and also assist them with marketing those trees if they decide that's the direction they want to go. And you can access those folks at a website uh, called findindianaforester.org. And so findindianaforester.org provides uh, listings by the areas they work in of both our consulting foresters who work uh, for landowners as agents and also industrial foresters who work for wood using industries as procurement foresters. Uh, and both those folks can provide assistance in marketing and valuation of trees. Uh, if you want to look at relative valuation of trees, there's also a, a publication that's put out by Indiana Division of Forestry on a, 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 a biannual basis, so twice a year, and it's called the Forest Products Price Report. And this should not be used as a current pricing tool. It is always a little out of date once it comes out in print, but it does provide some good relative information to get an idea of how your tree might stack up to other types of trees on the landscape. So uh, no easy answer to that, but some resources you can tap into to hopefully get answers as you need them. Great, thank you, Lenny. And again, we encourage you to, to ask, seek out those foresters to get those professional opinions on the, the, the valuation of your tree. So appreciate that, Lenny. Uh, Lindsay, I'm gonna have you come back on and have a question for you um, regarding tree health. So if a person has a tree that looks sick with some holes in it, how do they go about choosing an arborist? Uh, that's a tough one too, and a very common. I get a lot of calls on, I got a sick tree or got trees with uh, issues. Who do I call? Who do I trust? And um, first and foremost, um, the best thing to do is go to a website call, called treesaregood.org. And there's a web link there. I, I think it's even on our FNR webpage um, where you can enter your zip code and it gives you a list of arborists who are ISA certified, which means they do have a guaranteed body of knowledge. It doesn't necessarily uh, mean that they are uh, good business folks, but it does. They do have a code of ethics that they have to follow and in order to be, become a certified arborist. So, you know, I get, I get pictures like this um, in somebody's yard. You know, I've got a healthy, beautiful tree, but it's got this, this issue. And, you know, from the outset, the tree might look absolutely normal and beautiful as you see here. Um, but when you see big cavities like this, is the tree safe? And who do I call? And that's, again, the concern is making sure that you've got an ISA certified arborist and also get references. Um, you know, whenever you remodel your bathroom or your kitchen, or, or you, you always ask for pictures and say, you know, let me see your work. Well, with tree work, it's even easier because all you have to do is get addresses and drive by and see where they pruned or removed a tree to make sure they didn't cause any damage. And they actually did a good job of, of pruning and taking care of the trees. Another big issue is making sure that you get documentation from any tree care company that they are licensed and insured. Um, that's to protect you. Should they get hurt on your property, then they can also sue you as well. So it doesn't matter whether it's an electrician, an arborist, or a plumber. Make sure you get a bonded and licensed and insured professional to take care of that. And somebody that is risk assessment qualified can take a look at an issue like this and determine if it is safe. So if you have any questions about who to call, again, go to that website, treesaregood.org, any your zip code, and it'll give you a list of professionals there. Or you can call the FNR Extension Office and we can put you in touch uh, with the right people in your location. Thanks, Rod. Great, thank you, Lindsay. So make sure that your arborist is certified and make sure you, you rely on those references to select the proper person to help you with. So at this point, um, Lindsay, I'll have you stop sharing your screen so we can get to Mitch. So Mitch, one of the things that oftentimes also happens in the spring, in, in addition to people wanting to treat their algae, is to have questions about stocking fish. So should uh, a pond owner stock fish in their pond during the springtime? Thanks, Rod. And yeah, um, that's... You know, pretty common question this time of year, people are out working in their gardens, in their fields, they're planting stuff there and they start to think, well, should I also be planting something in my pond? And, 
And um, the, I guess the, the, the simplest answer is it's typically best to hold off stocking until you really know what's happening in your pond. And in most cases, you don't actually need to stock fish in your pond to remedy a fish problem. And um, the only time you really need to stock a pond is if it's a brand new pond or if you've recently renovated the pond and removed most of those fish. Um, if you have issues with smaller fish, stunted growth, um, an unbalanced fish population, something like that, then there are typically other methods that are much better at, at um, solving those issues. You might need to do some selective fish harvest. You might need to add some fish habitat, um, things like that. And so we have a, um, a great publication online about fish stocking. It talks about the, the species that you want to stock, the species that you want to avoid, um, how to stock fish, uh, when to stock and when not to stock. Um, and so this is a good um, starting point to, to ask some questions about whether stocking is a good idea for my pond or, or whether I could maybe use some of these other techniques to manage the fish there. Um, if you do plan to stock fish, if you do have a new pond or something like that, make sure you use a licensed um, fish hatchery to get your fish. This makes sure that they are not going to be introducing diseases into your pond. Um, similarly, it's best to use a, a fish hatchery rather than going out and trying to collect fish yourself. Once again, if you bring fish in that you've collected, you may not know exactly what species they are. You might be accidentally introducing problem fish or, or fish diseases. Um, so yeah, use a, use a licensed fish hatchery if you are going to stock, but, but typically if you have an existing pond with existing fish populations, it's best to hold off on stocking until you have a really good idea of, of what fish you already have there. Great. Thanks, Mitch. So, I mean, I think that's really great information. So really fish stocking is more of a last resort than a first approach. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. So again, uh, we see that there's a lot of information being posted in the comments below um, based on some of the stuff that Mitch just talked about. So we encourage you to check those out. So Jared, I have a question for you uh, regarding um, grasses, native grasses on your property. If a person would have these native grasses on their landscape, what's the best way to improve those for wildlife? Yeah, so good question. Um, we get a lot of this, this question this time of year and through the summer about um, having native grasses and, and how to improve them for wildlife. So a lot of people have native grasses on their property if they're interested in wildlife um, through programs like the Conservation Reserve Program, or maybe you just have them to the benefit of certain species. Um, but when they take management, right? So it's not a, just a, a one-time event planting these grasses. They take management over time to make sure that they're providing the best habit that, habitat they can for various wildlife species. So you have a lot of different options available to you. A lot of it depends on what they currently look like. Um, so I would encourage landowners that are interested in managing their native grasses for wildlife to go out and scout their fields and see what they currently look like. Uh, what they should look like for most wildlife species is you should have a mix of grasses. You should have a mix of forbs or wildflowers. So if you go out in the summer and you see a field that's really dominated by um, grass species like um, big blue stem or Indian grass or maybe switchgrass, some of the best things you might be able to do <clears throat> would be to reduce that grass density to improve the area, create more space for wildflowers and forbs to grow. And that could be through something like disking. Um, you could even encourage forbs by using a late summer prescribed fire in July, or August, or September. That can be a good method. You also want to be able to go out and scout for problematic species you may have, like invasive species. So those could be things like Cerecia lesbadiza, Canada thistle. Um, some of our cool season grasses might be problematic like uh, fescue or smooth brome or reed canary grass. And those species are often best controlled with some sort of herbicide application. Um, for some of our warm season plants like Cerecia lesbadiza, that's gonna occur in the summer. For cool season plants like cool season grasses, that herbicide application is gonna occur in the fall or the spring. And you might be saying, well, that's a lot of information uh, I need to know what's the best herbicide to control those species, maybe the timing and things like that. Well, luckily we have an awesome publication that we put together that kind of gives you a guide to managing native grasses for wildlife. So we're gonna add that to the um, chat box as well, but that goes through kind of what are the different options I have um, to improve these stands for wildlife. And then it talks to you about the details of 
of how to do these different things, how to, which herbicides to use, uh, maybe what time of year is the best to use something like prescribed fire or when the best time of year is to, to disc or till the field to improve it for wildlife. So again, that's gonna be added to the chat, um, but I just encourage you just to go out and, and kind of scout your fields this summer to see how they look and then you can start making management decisions once you know what you currently have. So Jared, would that be a, the place you'd recommend folks start? Would be that publication that you're about ready to add to the comment section to get that holistic sort of background information and then uh, think about steps, maybe reaching out to you for particular questions that they might have after reviewing that publication? Exactly, yeah. So I, that publication gives you a good idea of kind of what various wildlife species are looking for when it comes to native grasses and forbs. So how much grass should I have versus how much uh, wildflowers or forbs should I have? Even having shrub cover, some things like plum or hawthorn in the fields can be beneficial to a lot of wildlife species. So it kind of gives you that little bit of background information. And then it goes into, well, here are your different management options. Here are some common problems that we see um, in native grass stands, and here's the solutions to those problems. So that's a good first place to start. Um, if you have any other questions about it, certainly happy to answer. But again, going to that um, that website link we, we posted earlier that has contact information for biologists in your county, that can also be a great place to go because they can give you a really site-specific um, plan and information about how to improve your property and, and native grasses for wildlife. So Jared, how about we take a quick break right here and, and hit the chat box to see if we have any additional questions that our viewers may have for us and that we can uh, rely on our experts to provide that feedback. All right, we can do that. So um, Brian, you're, you're just a, a very um, uh, popular individual today. We got a lot of wildlife damage questions. So we're gonna kick it to the wildlife damage stuff. And we're going to ask you a question about best way to keep Canada geese off your property. Yeah, so there's Canada geese is a, a problem in areas, especially um, if you're close to water and in a lot of developments, whether those be business or home, uh, there's water retention ponds there and those are often really attractive to geese. And they, they like to graze on grass. And so grass that is fertilized and kept low, uh, they actually like that. Uh, they can see predators uh, coming. Uh, it's open, it's a food source. If it's close to water, that's gonna be close to cover. So it's very attractive. So there's a couple different ways you can approach that. Um, you can make it less likely for them to, if they're walking up from water onto the grass, is to do some type of a buffer from the grass, between the grassy area, the lawn, and also the water. And so that could be large riprap. Uh, and you'll see that around some ponds. Uh, it could be a natural vegetation barrier. So the DNR on their site actually has some good information on uh, nuisance wild, uh, uh, nuisance goose control. And they've got some planting um, seed mixes for buffers to prevent geese from going from water to, to land and land to water. Now they're capable of flying and so it's not a foolproof thing but it does make the general area uh, less attractive for them. There are also repellents out there. Uh, one is a taste repellent. It's made under a couple different formulas It's uh, and so you can spray it on things and geese won't eat it but it doesn't necessarily mean they won't hang out in that area. And so it's not 100% for keeping your geese out of the area. It helps in keeping them from eating certain things you don't want them to eat. Uh, the other, which is a restricted use pesticide called flight control, it's sold under that name, I think a couple other ones, uh, is basically it's a taste repellent, but you apply it to the whole lawn and it makes from, the, from when they're flying, it makes it look different. And so it doesn't look like regular grass. And so they associate that with the, the bad taste and the sickness they got from eating it. And so they tend to avoid those areas. And so that's a repellent that's more of an area repellent, acts as one, even though it's actually more of a taste repellent because you have to eat it to get the effect uh, from that standpoint. So that's actually a pretty good way 
uh, to get them off there. But that is a restricted use uh, pesticide. So you have to have a licensed applicator to do that. So there are nuisance wildlife control operators who do that sort of thing. We have a publication on the web store uh, on how to select a nuisance wildlife control operator. Uh, there's probably a lot of lawn and, and uh, uh, industry people who are have pesticide applicator license who can apply it in those situations as well. So that would be another uh, outlet for that as well. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, and so we got another uh, question that I'll let Brian, Lindsay, or Lenny respond to it. Um, if you'd like, but it's about how to keep deer from damaging the leaves of uh, young trees, especially fruit trees. Well, it's a tough one. Um, one of the as far as uh, land landscape plants and residential areas is try to is try to manage the deer population with the types of plants that you have. Um, Brian or Lenny might be able to comment on which types of trees are less attractive, but there are some um, some some less harmful ways to to keep deer away. Uh, one of the things that has worked in some locations is just having you know, a cat or a pet in the area that can sometimes deter them, especially in residential areas. Now, uh, more rural areas, Lenny might, or Brian might be able to add to that. Situation, if you're in a situation where you have a larger area or in a rural area uh, and interested in controlling an orchard, one of the tools we use for our tree plantings is exclusion fencing. And we're using a seven and a half to eight foot tall polypropylene mesh that's mounted on whatever type of post you want to utilize, wood posts, T posts, or T posts with extensions on them. And we found that to be very successful at excluding deer. Uh, these are not uh, lifetime fences. Typically the standard duty plastic will be good for six to eight years. You can get heavy duty that's good for longer. If you need a really long-term solution, you may want to look at uh, some sort of metal fencing or being prepared to replace the fencing. Another option is the baited electrified fencing. And so we essentially put electrified fence up and bait it with a, uh, a scent or taste attractant, something like peanut butter or apple odor. And the deer will touch the fence, uh, trying to e explore that, get a jolt and associate that fence with the pain. And both those techniques can be relatively effective uh, in rural areas. Great, thanks, Lenny and Lindsay. How about um, if they're interested in protecting maybe individual trees, is there a way that they can exclude deer from individual trees? On smaller planted uh, hardwood trees, you can use what's called tree tubes. There's a variety of different ones available. Uh, it's usually a six to eight inch diameter plastic tube on a stake that's designed to protect the seedling from browsing the top of that seedling until it emerges from the tube. And we usually recommend folks get at least a five foot tall tube to make sure the deer can't take the tops off the seedlings. Once they emerge from the tube, then they can expand and grow their canopy. Uh, but it has some limitations in terms of what you're wanting to use your trees for, but that is one option. Uh, wire cages are also another option using wire fencing to create a cage that will keep the deer off of the sides or tops of the trees may be effective as well for small numbers of trees. Great, thanks, Lenny. All right, um, Lindsay, we've got another question for you. Um, we have a, someone that has a willow tree that each year has a large mushroom growing out of it. Is it potentially gonna kill my willow tree? Um, mushrooms or any types of fruiting bodies that are growing out of any types of tree is an indication of decay. Um, and that means that there's a dead wood and the actual fungal organism is decaying the wood um, through excretion of enzymes and what's causing it could cause a weakness there. So anytime you see fruiting bodies, that means there's some uh, saprophyte working on the wood materials and should be inspected by an arborist to make sure that there isn't a risk of it failing. Great, thanks. 
Lindsay, appreciate the answer. Um, Rod, we got a question for you. Um, how can you tell if a turtle is still in brumation or if it's actually sick? Well, that's a good question. And so largely I would say that depends on the time of the year. Oftentimes uh, these turtles, especially in the Northern half of the state will overwinter, whether they be in an aquatic system or they go uh, subterranean if they're more in, an, in, a, in a landscape, a ter terrestrial landscape. So, so time of year, usually by May, this time of year, most of that brumation has subsided and animals are out and active. Obviously the behavior of the animal, if they're acting really lethargic, it could be a sign that they're sick, um, but some turtles, if they're really sick, will show clinical signs. And so you might see ocular discharge or, or goopy eyes or nasal discharge, all showing signs that that particular turtle is, is, is certainly sick. And then you could, uh, if you're interested, you could reach out to the, the Department of Natural Resources or uh, one of the animal rescues to see if there's a way that they could treat that animal or just leave the animal alone. A lot of times they'll actually seek the sun and elevate their body temperature, particularly if it's a virus, to increase their body temperature to help purge their system of that particular virus. And oftentimes they'll they'll just sort of cure themselves by by seeking warmer temperatures. Great. So for those that may not know, what is bromation? So bromation is very similar to hibernation, except that the animal doesn't completely go to sleep. And so if you think about box turtles, for example, are a great example of bromation. Um, Brian mentioned the frost line when it, with regard to moles and how the depth that moles will overwinter. Well, tur box turtles will do the same thing. As the frost line goes from six inches to eight inches, those box turtles will dig deeper into the soil to remain under the, uh, the soil frost line and they undergo sort of a limited uh, movement, not completely asleep like a hibernating animal would be. So it's just going into a state of torpor or a state of rest, uh, but not completely asleep. Awesome. Well, we appreciate the answer. Um, looks like we've caught up with all the, the live questions we got um, and all the questions that we got prior to the event. So with that, I uh, appreciate everybody joining us on Facebook Live for this and asking questions. Hopefully we provided with you with some information that's useful. That you can use this spring on your property um, and I'll invite everyone back on uh, the screen here just to say thanks and, and we appreciate everybody's uh, time for joining us. And if you're interested in, in more of these resources and answers to questions, we we'll really um, like to, to have you go to our Purdue Extension, FNR Extension page, but also our Purdue Education, Purdue Extension Education Store, where you can find more resources for a variety of natural resources topics. So with that, we appreciate everybody joining us and, and Let's get on with your day. Thank you.